part as I was listening to my dad share a little bit about uh, the our loved ones, our the people that we know who are are lost, and really the the the, the kind of mission we've been given as the people of God to desire to see the lost saved. And everyone in here, because we know the Father's heart for the lost, time and time again throughout Scripture, He cares for the lost. And so to have a heart that is like Christ is to care for the lost. And everyone in this room has someone, has someone in their life that they know needs Jesus. Maybe we think that they're far from Jesus, but maybe they just need Jesus. They need to meet Him for the first time. And so as I think about that, and I think about this morning's message, and I was, uh, this is not actually in my text, but it's just something that came to, to mind. I was thinking of Acts chapter 1, which is written by Luke. It's the second kind of continuation of Luke, for those who didn't know. And he says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. One key word there I want us to look at is, I wrote about all that Jesus began. So the work that Jesus began here in Acts, he sends the Spirit of God to come upon the people of God to continue the work that Jesus was doing, and that is to seek and to save the lost. We don't save the lost, but we introduce them to the one who saves the lost. Amen? You are empowered. The reason I wanted to share that is that's what Acts goes on to tell us, is that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we might help others find Jesus, that we might be image bearers of Christ to reveal Jesus to others. Think of this passage uh, time and time again in this message when I think of, of Zacchaeus. There was this moment that God ordained this tree that had been planted by a roadside so that in the moment that Zacchaeus, who needed to meet Jesus, he needed to see Jesus. And so out of the providence of God, he laid this, planted this tree, I don't know how long before time, but he put this tree in this roadside to grow and to grow and to grow so that the day, when the day came that Jesus was passing by, Zacchaeus would be able to climb that tree and see Jesus. The, the, the parallel here that I'm working with is there are moments coming up, there are God-ordained moments that he has been setting up in place for years prior that he has placed you in a particular position that you might show Jesus to someone. There might be an encounter. There's a situation. There's something coming up where someone needs to see Jesus, and they're going to see Jesus in you. So walk with an awareness and a knowledge of the fact that you have the Spirit alive inside of you. You have the Jesus that people need to see and to meet. Amen? Not part of my message this morning, just a bonus uh, material, I guess. If you all can remember back uh, two weeks ago, uh, when I was last uh, preaching, two Sundays ago, we were in 1 Corinthians 12, where the Apostle Paul is talking about the body of Christ, where he compares it to the human body made up of various parts. Each part with a necessary function and a different function than any other part. The emphasis that was revealed throughout that analogy that can be found throughout his analogy is that there are no insignificant parts in the human body. There are no insignificant parts in the body of Christ. There are also no independent parts in the human body. There's no independent parts in the body of Christ, meaning that the body of Christ needs you but you also need the body of Christ. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It's part of the intentional makeup of the body of Christ by the Creator God. As a believer, if you're a believer in this room today, you don't choose to be part of the body of Christ or not. By default, being a believer joins you to Christ, and to one another. You are part of the body of Christ. You really don't get a choice 
in the matter if you are his son or daughter. This means if you hear the sound of my voice today, even in here, online, later on, you hear the sound of my voice and you are a follower of Jesus, you are an intentional part of God's wonderfully diverse family with a specific purpose and function in his body. But what is that function? After last, after, like, not last week, I'll have to remember this. Two weeks ago, the message, I had conversations afterwards, just those questions about what kind of function? What is my role? What is my function? Is my function just to show up on Sundays? Is my function just to give my money, just to give my time? Is it just to volunteer in some area of the church gathering? Is that my purpose? Is it just to do something whenever I'm asked? Is that the function that I serve? Many people wrestle with this question. What's my role? Where's my place to serve in the body of Christ? Which part of the body am I? An arm, a leg, a, a kidney? Which part of the body of Christ am I? And it's an important discovery. It's an important discovery because you have been uniquely made, spiritually gifted, and intentionally placed. According to 1 Corinthians 12, you've been specifically placed where God wanted you in the body for God's purposes. So it's an important discovery to find what is my function. So this morning, it's my hope and my prayer that we would leave this place with a clearer vision of our role in the body of Christ, that we would be able to discover the unique part that we play within the body, and that the Spirit of God would inspire us to step into that role and begin to function in that role or reveal to us maybe where we've already been doing that. Maybe we've already been filling that role and just haven't been made aware of it. So if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. For just, of, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve it. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Father God, I ask this morning that our hearts would be open, would be the, the soft soil to hear and to receive your word. Allow your spirit to bring new understanding, to bring revelation, to inspire and to encourage. I pray that the words that I share would be of your spirit would not be of my own words, they would not be of my own flesh or my own desires, but they would mirror the desire that is of your spirit for your people. My desire is to build up and to encourage this body as you have commissioned me to do. Do only the work that your spirit can do this morning in our lives. Fill us with your spirit this morning as we hear your word, Lord. Help us to be open and receptive. In your name we pray. Amen. Here in the 12th chapter of Romans, we find Paul using the same analogy, just in a little less detail, that he did in Corinthians. Just as we have one physical body with many members, they don't all have the same function. This is true for the body of Christ. We don't just have a bunch of duplicates in the room. We have different parts serving different functions that only they can serve. We are one body with different gifts, as it says in verse 6. And then such an important part 
of verse 6 that I don't want anyone in the room to miss is it says that each of us has received different gifts according to the grace of God. Each of us. How many does that mean? Everyone. Every single person has received different a different gift or gifts, plural. Every single person, no one excluded according to the grace of God, meaning that none of us earned this specific gift. It wasn't based on your intelligence. It wasn't based on your status. It wasn't based on any ethnicity. It was freely given without merit on our part by the grace of God. Then Paul continues in verses 7 and 8, listing some of the gifts given to the members of the body, prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, showing mercy. But this is where things get a little complex. For those of you who've uh, been around spiritual gift teachings, if you've been in church for a while, this is where things get more complex because this is not an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts in the body. This isn't all of them. There are several different lists throughout the New Testament, making at least uh, 20 different spiritual gifts. No one list contains all of these. Each list has certain ones that are left out, and there's others on other lists. It gets a little confusing. So if you've been in church most of your life, you've no doubt been encouraged to take a spiritual gift test at some point in time. Have you not? Someone, anyone in the room, you've taken the spiritual gift test, you've come out with some kind of results. And I think those can be helpful. I'm not against them. I'm not necessarily promoting them either way, but I'm taking a different approach today to help us discover maybe what God has gifted us with. So maybe you already know your spiritual gift. Maybe you've taken those tests. Maybe you've operated in spiritual gifts or functioned in that way within the body of Christ. But many people still struggle to find what their gift is. In many ways that we've approached spiritual gifts, oftentimes there may be ways that we've been gifted or, or can be allowed to be gifted that we've never been aware of or we've just excluded from our lives thinking, this is my one gift and that's it. So more on that in just a moment. And I think the reason why that we struggle with What's my gift? Where's my fit? I think one of the reasons why we struggle is because we tend to focus on the gifts, on what happens when we come together as the church, don't we? We think about what happens when we come here. We think of preaching. We think of teaching. We think of serving. We think of, or we think of how the Spirit moves in terms of prophesying or tongues or interpretations of tongues or words of wisdom and knowledge. We think about those gifts that manifest themselves when the body of Christ comes together, that function while we're here as, pe- as a people. We think of serving as a greeter or an usher or a kid's worker. We think of all of these different functions. But spiritual gifts given to the parts of the church body, the members of the body, are much broader than that and maybe much more subtle than that. Some examples that are often overlooked, that, that are spiritual gifts that we often overlook, are gifts like administration. Generosity is called a spiritual gift. Encouragement, leadership, mercy, helps, hospitality, discernment of spirits. These are gifts that are often overlooked in the body of Christ. And so the first thing that I want to point out that should be pointed out, because as you read these, you're probably questioning. First thing I want to point out is that some things that are identified as spiritual gifts are actually also just acts of believers. What do I mean? We're all meant to encourage one another, right? We're all meant to show mercy, right? We're all meant to be generous, right? But Scripture indicates that God has uniquely graced some individuals to excel, almost like a a superpower in some of these specific areas. 
And so if you excel in those areas, and that's just a, a, an area that seems like, well, everybody's just supposed to do that, but you excel in that area, that may be why it doesn't seem like a spiritual gift to you, because it becomes so natural. Why does it come natural? You've been spiritually gifted to excel in that area. You likely have no idea that you've even been doing it, that you've even been functioning in that way because the Spirit of God has uniquely gifted you there. The other thing you'll notice about these gifts, the gifts that I just read right here, is they don't happen on a stage. They don't happen with a lot of acknowledgement, do they? You don't really know that they're going on. They're just part of ordinary relationships. They're just part of uh, groups of people, just human, regular human interaction that you're having. These gifts are revealing themselves and without any recognition. That's why, though, I believe that we need an expanded vision of how the parts of the body work together. These various gifts, the gifts that maybe we don't acknowledge, maybe we don't even see going on. They don't happen on the stage, but they're happening week in, week out. They're happening day after day. They're happening through the week in just a momentary uh, conversation, just a a phone call that's being made, just a, a gesture that's happening. We need an expanded vision of how the parts are all working together because it's not all just about getting everyone volunteering at church services, finding a place to plug in and to get involved and to do. That's not, we're going to limit ourselves as a fully functioning body if we think that's the way that gifts play themselves out. We're going to miss out all of the diverse beauty of the giftings that are in each and every person if we limit them to those types of functions. It's not just about volunteering and serving in various areas. It is, that is part of what we do. That is part of the, the regular need that is ongoing as part of the church. But we, sh- we limit ourselves by, by just uh, uh, reducing it to those things. And so a fully functioning body isn't just how or where you volunteer. It's about being used by the Spirit who has come upon you in the very moment that is in front of you, the very people that are in your presence. From the moment you walked in this door today, the Spirit upon you, the gift inside of you, has been operating in some kind of way with others. You may not be aware of it, or maybe it hasn't been operating. You've been holding back. You've been holding back what the body of Christ actually needs to be a fully functioning body. It's about being used by the Spirit that has come upon you. Uh, Let me get to that. So it's about being used by the Spirit that has come upon you in the very moment that's in front of you, which may even include this. I think this is such an important part as we consider spiritual gifts and what our function, what our role is in the body of Christ. This may even include receiving a spiritual gift for a specific moment or a season of time. I'm not talking about a lifelong spiritual gift, but one that's just for a moment or season of time. You see, spiritual gifts shouldn't be looked at as this is the one that I've got and that's it. I took the test. I found out the spiritual gift that I have. That's all I've got. That's all I'm going to get. There's nothing else to receive. Because ultimately, spiritual gifts are about when the Spirit of God comes on us to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in the church and in the world around us. Whether that's just for a moment or whether that's for a lifetime. You might receive a spiritual gift for a specific occasion and never again. A momentary uh, 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 ounce, (laughs) I'll say, of God's grace in this particular area for this particular moment. So that's why I want to, that's why a little bit breaking outside of what's our spiritual gifts and taking a, a, a test and finding out what that one thing is because there could be any moment 
if we're open and receptive to receive God's Spirit for the occasion, for the relationship, or the situation that's in front of us, that the Spirit of God can gift us for that moment in the way that God needs. So you might receive it for just a moment. But as we build on this idea, as we think of spiritual gifts, as so we, we're building on this idea of being a part or a member of the body of Christ with a specific role, with a specific gift. There's more for us to consider than just spiritual gifts as it relates to belonging to part of the body and what our function and what our role is. There is spiritual gifts. That's very important. But also, there's more. It is bringing those gifts together for service and for the good of the body, but there's more. There are multiple ingredients. There are multiple things that come together to make you who you are and what you contribute to the body of Christ. Who you matter, or who you are, sorry, who you are matters. The person that you are. Here's what I mean. Psalm 1. 39, 13. And so as we think about this, I'm going to try to clarify this. We have spiritual gifts, part of the equation. This is how God has supernaturally made me. But then there's also the person that you are. There's the person that makes up you. So let's go into Psalm 139, verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I have fearfully and wonderfully made your Works are wonderful. I know that full well. To be fearfully and wonderfully made speaks of the complexity and the distinctness of our design as humans. So there's complexity, but I want to I emphasize, in, in context of what I'm talking about this morning, I want to emphasize distinction, the uniqueness or the difference between each person in this room. The word used for wonderfully made gets used throughout the Old Testament as set apart or distinguish between. In Exodus 11.7, the same word gets used in reference to the difference that God made between Israel and Egypt. There's a distinction there. We were made distinct from one another. We were uniquely made different than one another. We have unique natures. We have different preferences. We have different personalities. We have different skills. We have different abilities. We have different intellects. We have different backgrounds. And we have different experiences that all contribute to who we are today. And tomorrow, we won't be the same people that we are today. We'll change ever so slightly. Next year, we will be different than we are today. I see this very clearly in my children. I've got four kids. We don't really know what the personality type is of the youngest one yet, but the other three are very different people. They come from the same parents, but here you get to see it firsthand. These kids are growing up. They're not developing any, from any outside sources yet, just their natural personalities, who, they're, who they are, how they function, how they respond. They're very different people. They're made uniquely. So let's bring those two things together. You are distinctly made. You are unlike anyone else. Then according to God's grace, He has given you spiritual gifts. And as we, as I referenced earlier, and He continues to give you spiritual gifts for either the entirety of your life or for a moment. So you are distinctly made and you have been given spiritual gifts. Then he has placed you in the body exactly where he wants you to be, as seen in 1 Corinthians 12, so that you can be the part that only you can be. So that you can be the part that only me. You've been distinctly made. distinctly created, distinctly shaped, distinctly made. You have been gifted by God through the power of the Spirit uniquely. And then you have been placed in the body exactly where God wants you. 
You, you can't be duplicated. You've been placed where you are so that you can be the part that only you can be. You can't be duplicated. Can someone have the same spiritual gifts that you have? Absolutely. But they weren't made the way that you were made. They haven't lived the life that you have lived. They haven't seen the joy and the suffering that you've seen. They can't do what you can do. They don't think the way that you think. They can't fully function as the part of the body that you were designed to be. They can't function as the part of the body that only you were designed to be. And so I recognize, though, that the easy part of, uh, the easy part of this is knowing what makes you uniquely you. We're aware of who we are. We're aware of how we function, how we think, our personality, our preferences, what we're capable of doing in our natural abilities and skills. We know this. But let's get back to this discovery of spiritual gifts. If God has a specific part for you to play in the body of Christ, it's reasonable to assume that you'll never really know that part until you discover the gifts that you have if you're not already aware of them. And so where I recommend that we begin is with what is in right, what is right in front of us. In C.S. Lewis, The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, where Father Christmas shows up and gives each one of the four children a mysterious gift from Aslan, who's the, the lion in Lewis' story who represents Jesus. These gifts are mysterious. And at the time, the children can't figure out why they've been given these gifts. But in the midst of their battle with the white witch, Lucy realizes that her gift, a healing ointment, was given to her to bind up the wounded in battle. Peter realizes that he's been given a sword so that he can lead an assault on the forces of the white witch. C.S. Lewis was trying to say that one of the ways we figure out what Aslan wants from us is by looking at the gifts that he's placed in our hands. So we begin looking at what's in our hands, what's right in front of us. But still, figuring that out might not be as obvious. What actually is in my hands? Because it's not uh, literally in my hands, but what is that right in front of me? And so while I was studying, I found this helpful uh, Venn diagram. If you could bring that up, Sabrina, this diagram that I have um, on the screen for you today, because it won't help if I just explain it. So as we think about what's in our hands, what is right in front of us, I found this uh, diagram from uh, the author Jim Collins, a book of his. It's used in a slightly different context, but I found it to be really helpful for this particular exercise. If we look at and think about our ability, what is this? It's what we're naturally good at. What are you naturally good at? And then the next circle, we think about affinity. What is it that you're passionate about? What do you really care about? And then third, uh, we have affirmation. That's where the people in the church, the people around you tell you how God is using you, what they identify in you. And where all of these three circles come together, that sweet spot in the middle is typically a place of a spiritual gift where your ability your affinity, what you're really passionate about, and what people are saying, God's blessed you there. God's gifted you there. I see this strength in you. So think about that for just a moment in your own life. Think for just a moment. What are you good at? What are you just naturally good at? Because God's created you that way. God created you to be naturally good at some things for a reason. Secondly, what are you passionate about? What do you care really deeply about? And then sec thirdly, what have other people identified in you? What have they said? What do you hear on a regular basis? What have you heard in your life like, hey, you really seem to excel in this particular area? The thing I usually identify or see in people is, is because I, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm real great at it, is I see people and I'm like, man, you're, you're so encouraging to other people. 
And so I spot that in people uh, very easily. So think about your own life in those particular areas because oftentimes spiritual gifts coincide with natural abilities that we already have. God takes some natural talent that he gave you, he intentionally gave you, and he empowers it by the Spirit for his purposes, for his good. That's why one of the reasons why, that it may not even seem like a spiritual gift to us. Why? It's just been a natural ability that we have. We've always had it. We've always done this. I know there's been abilities in my own life that have been the same way, that I've, hey, I've just always been this way, till someday you have, hey, there's several people who've said to me, hey, you're really good at this thing. And then your eyes open like, I, I am? But you don't realize it. Why? Because it's just been a natural thing for you your whole life. And so there's times where that is part of your spiritual gifting. But as we look at this diagram, as we consider these three different areas, I think one of the most important components for us to uh, acknowledge and for every one of us to consider is affirmation. It is affirmation because over the course of my four decades now of being in and around the church, I can't tell you how many times that I have discovered a brother or sister saying to someone else, hey, I see this in you. You're a great encourager. You have a really great gift to, uh, in, to teach. Hey, you seem, you're really generous. You're always just giving of your time. You're giving of your resources. You're giving of everything that you have. You just, you're just generous. And so it's right there in front of us, and we may not recognize it because it becomes so natural to us. And so why do I say that? Why do I think that is important for us? I, and, and I want to encourage you this morning in this. If you see a gift in someone in this room, you see a gift in someone that's part of the body of Christ, let me encourage you, let them know. Let them know it. They may have no clue that they've been operating in this thing all along. And so there's this giftedness that every time you see them, they've been doing it. They've been serving it all the while. What have they been doing? Searching for their spiritual gift. What am I gifted at? What am I good at? What, is, what has God placed inside of me? And the reality is they've been doing it day after day after day with no realization that that is the hand of God on your life. That is the Spirit of God indwelling you. So let me encourage you again. Let someone know. If you identify something into them, let them know, hey, you're good at this. Hey, God's gifted you in this. I see how God is using you in this particular area. But it's not always just natural abilities. I don't want us just to look at, hey, this is just natural ability, what you have, uh, what you're able to do. It's not always natural abilities. We know this because time and time again, Throughout Scripture, we see God using people under the power of the Spirit to achieve things that they were not naturally good at, right? We see them achieving these things. Not to mention that there are spiritual gifts that have nothing to do with our natural abilities, but rather they are supernatural impartation of the Spirit of God, like prophecy, healings, tongues, interpretation of tongues, gifts of knowledge and wisdom. No one in this room has that natural ability. That is purely by the Spirit of God. And I think we'll have to do a specific message to just explore these gifts because it's an entirely different approach to identifying these gifts, exercising, practicing, finding out if these are our gifts. It's a totally different thing than maybe what comes more natural to us. But the bottom line here is this, is that you have spiritual gifts. You. If you're hearing you, it's you. You have spiritual gifts, and you will receive more spiritual gifts. And the truth is the body of Christ needs your gift. But it's not just a matter of the body of Christ needing your gifts. It does need your gifts. You need the gifts that, that the body of Christ has to provide. The body of Christ needs the gift that you have to provide, but it's not just about need. It's about stewardship. 
It's about stewardship of what God has given to you. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Meaning this, that not using the gifts we have received to serve others makes us unfaithful stewards of God's grace. And what's interesting that I always think about stewardship, every time I think about stewardship, what's interesting about it is that it indicates a lack of ownership. When I'm stewarding something, I don't own it. And it reminds me of the parable of the talents, does it not? In Matthew 25, there's a master who goes away on a journey. He leaves his money, his money. He leaves his money in the care of three servants. Two of the servants invest his money. One hides the money. When the master returns, he tells the two who stewarded the money well of their future reward. Here's how you'll be rewarded. And the one who didn't steward well, he tells him of his punishment, saying this in verse 30. He says, And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Will there be punishment for poor stewardship? I don't know for sure. I'm not here to claim definitely there will be. But when I read this particular text, cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When I read that, there's at least enough for cause for concern, right? There's enough to there to think about What has God entrusted in my care to steward? And I know you're probably thinking, well, Jesus is talking about money, right? Talents here. He's talking about a a form of money. He's talking about how we steward our money, but it's more than just money. Why do I say this? Because when we think about the symbolism of this text, Jesus being the master who's gone away, you and I being the servants and the talents representing his possessions, then the question has to be asked, what all are his possessions? What has Jesus left in our care? What are we stewarding today? Is it just money? It's not. It's all the Lord's, is it not? It's all his. Everything belongs to him. Everything that I have, even down to the relationships that I'm steward, the children that are in my household, I have a responsibility to steward them well. He's entrusted them to my care. So the relationships, the money, the skills that I have, the intellects, the intellect that I have, and in the context of today's message, the gifts that I've been given, I'm to steward them well. All of these things, God has trusted me to steward. And so the question is, will we be good stewards of what he's given to us? Will we be, will we be uh, of, of the things that he's entrusted in our care, will we also be good stewards of our role in the body of Christ? Will we be a good steward of being an arm or a leg? The gifts that we've been given to serve the body of Christ, will we be a good steward? Because what we have been given isn't just for us. It's not just for uh, show or for us just to admire it, look at this great skill that I have. It's not just for earthly gain. It's for the body, and it's to be used. That's why Paul doesn't just list the gifts in Romans 12. You notice this? In Romans 12, he doesn't just list the gifts. He says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If your gift is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. Then he goes on and on and on. So he's saying if it's, if it's prophecy, if that's your gift, do it. If it's serving, do it. If it's teaching, do it. If it's encouragement, do it. But then notice something that changes on the last three. Notice he switches something on the last three. I found this interesting as I was studying. 
These first ones, he says, if it's prophecy, do it. If it's serving, do it. If it's teaching, do it. And then he changes on how to do it on the final three. He changes to how to do it. If giving, give generously. He doesn't just say give. He says give generously. If leading, he doesn't, he doesn't just say just lead. He says do it diligently. He says if it's showing mercy, he doesn't just say sh- show mercy. He says do it cheerfully. And so what's to be gleaned from that? As I was sitting down and praying, I'm seeking the Lord. What is this? What, why does he change? What does he switch here? Why does he change the way that he's communicating this in this particular passage? Here's what I take from that. First of all, use the gift that you've been given. Do it. That's what he's saying. Do it. And then secondly, what is he saying? Do it wholeheartedly. Give generously. Sir, lead diligently. Show mercy, do it cheerfully. Serve one another with passion. Serve one another with the gift that you've been given, with all that you have, your whole heart. Because, church, we have been gifted, all of us, every person in this room. We've been uniquely wired, distinctly designed. And then we have been specifically placed to play a part in the body that only we can play. That is unique to you. No one else can do that. You are an active part in what God wants to do in this church body and in the world today. And that's why he's made you the way that you are, and that's why he's given you the gifts that you have. Because he has an active role for you to play. And yes, this is primarily, this is about God's work. This is about doing the work of the Lord that is in front of us. But in addition to doing the work that is in front of us, this is also about living the life that you were designed to live. Because you've been created in such a way, you've been gifted in such a way, and you have a role to play in the body of Christ, that it means that this is what you were created for. This is the role, this is the function, this is the work that you were designed to do, meaning this. If we live the life that God intended for us to live, utilizing the gifts that are in our life for His purposes, this is the path to full life. This is the path to living the life that we were intended to live. This is living into the full design of the Creator as we were originally created to do so. Amen? Let's bow our heads this morning. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word this morning. I pray that this word would settle in deep into our hearts, take root within us, and that it would continue to grow. We would continue to meditate upon how are you intending to use me, God? What's in my hands? And that you would would reveal to us where we've already been active or you would reveal to us where we've been inactive and you would inspire us, you would encourage, you would motivate us to get active in your body, in the way that you've gifted us so that we might be a fully functioning body. Stir us up this morning, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be blessed this week. Go in peace. I think it's next week is family table, next Sunday after church. So make plans to stay around, eat lunch with us, but be blessed this week.